Okay, so here we are again. And um, so I'm telling you about the inhomogeneous universe. And I've given it a subtitle, at least that's how I understood my brief anyway. Is, um, and the subtitle is what is inside those black boxes called CAM and class. Some of you probably know what CAM and class are. They're basically codes that allow you to compute things like the present day meta distribution and the CMB and isotropies. So, uh, and, and we all sort of know that there's some initial conditions given by the theory of inflation, and then you just put your initial conditions into these black boxes, and then these black boxes spit out what you should expect to see today for observations. So what I want to do in the next uh, few lectures is to actually give you an idea of what's inside these black boxes, okay? So, um, so just uh, by way of, uh, well, okay, so basically we'll be looking at uh, mostly what's happening at this fairly low redshift universe, okay? Um, so around, uh, you know, CMB formation times, and then all the way down to the present day. And, uh, well, just to motivate it, so, so last week we looked at homogeneous universe, uh, because that's a nice assumption that we can put into our theory, and then that immediately yields some interesting results like expanding space, and we can talk about thermal history, et cetera. Uh, but in reality, of course, uh, the universe is not homogeneous or isotropic, because we see structures. We see galaxies all around us, and they're distributed in a way that exhibits, exhibits like a clear, uh, well, kind of, well, there's some pattern to it. Like, for example, you look at, it, look at uh, uh, this picture here of the red galaxies observed by the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, you see immediately that there are these void regions and filaments, etc. And over here, this is a simulation of the uh, hydrogen clouds that we ex expect to see in the intergalactic space. So again, it's highly inhomogeneous. Okay. And even then, um, if you go back to, uh, uh, um, you know, like the cosmic microwave background radiation, even that is not a homogeneous background, despite the fact that the fluctuations is only of order 10 to minus 5. Okay? And, uh, uh, and again, you see these cold regions and hot regions, etc. Now, when you analyze the clustering statistics of these uh, um, um, inhomogeneities, what you find are things like um, these power spectra. Okay, so that's a temperature correlation power spectrum of the CMB, the polarization, etc. And in the future, which I'm sure you've all seen before in some context or another. And uh, uh, you can actually also uh, look at uh, um, what is called a B mode uh, of the polarization, which, so that's the temperature, E mode polarization, and a B mode, etc. Okay, so, um, so and this here is a prediction of the, um, well, I, I know this here is the matter power spectrum, and that's basically uh, encoding information about the uh, clustering statistics of the uh, density fluctuations. Okay, again, this is something that we can predict from theory, which is the black line, and then you have a lot of data that's uh, basically measuring this power spectrum. We have Planck and Sloan on the BOSS survey, DES, etc. And from these observations, we have uh, been able to figure out a model, which is the Lambda CDM model, and which is basically a uh, model that has six free parameters, uh, like the, the cold dark matter density, baryon density, the expansion rate, initial conditions, uh, optical depth, that's an astrophysical parameter. And all these parameters, these six parameters, have been measured to extremely high precision. We're talking about 1% precision. Um, from, from uh, on these uh, parameters from um, the Planck measurements, for example. So uh, the plan of what I want to do is to, as said, to give you an idea about the theory that goes into predicting these inhomogeneities, okay? And then I'll describe why the power spectrum looks the way it does, and why the CMB temperature power spectrum looks the way it does, and how we can use this information to constrain cosmological parameters. Okay, and finally, I'll say a few words about CMB polarization, which is basically where CMB observations are moving to these days. Okay, I, I really don't know if I have the time to do all of these topics, so I'll try my best to, uh, to cover as much as possible. Okay, all right, okay, so um, now we're gonna do look at the theoretical framework. And uh, okay, so one, one more scene setting slide over here. So that's basically the, the, the generic scheme we're looking at. We have 
inflation to begin with, which is something that happened in the very early universe, and that gave us um, basically a set of initial conditions for the inhomogeneities. Okay? Now, um, so they, uh, they set the, the initial perturbations of, uh, that, that, I mean, inflation gives us uh, fluctuations in the space time metric initially, and these forms basically the seeds for the CMB fluctuations and the large scale structure perturbations that we see today. Now, over time, what's going to happen is that gravity will kick in, and that will compete with pressure, intrinsic pressure of the stuff that we have in the universe. So you have gravity pulling things in and then pressure pushing things out. And that is interplay here would lead to basically the, uh, the, 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 the inhomogeneities that we see today. The inhomogeneities that we see today eventually become the uh, CMB anisotropies and the perturbations in the non-relativistic matter would become uh, what we see in structure formation. And all of this kind of competition between gravity and pressure takes place essentially around the time of uh, um, well, just before matter radiation equality and all the time, all the way into the matter domination uh, epoch. Now, the way we um, uh, uh, deal, with, we treat, the way we investigate uh, perturbations is actually quite straightforward. We use the same framework as we did, did before, so it's basically GR and Boltzmann equations. Okay, so exactly the same thing that I told you last week uh, about how you treat um, particles in an expanding universe, you know, this applies as well. It's just that the only difference here is that we now allow my space-time to be inhomogeneous, okay, and I allow perturbations to develop so that I have an additional spatial dependence in all of my equations. That's it, really. Now, um, also, the other thing uh, is that uh, the fluctuations that we expect to see at least at early times, around CMB times, are quite small. Um, and even now we know that the CMB temperature fluctuations are only of order 10 to the minus 5. So what it means is that it's actually quite okay to do perturbation theory. And in fact, linear perturbation theory suffices to describe the CMB. So that's the framework we'll stick with. Okay? We use GR, we use Boltzmann equation, and we do linear perturbation theory. Okay? So, so to begin with, we write down the metric. Okay, so it would be G mu nu. And since we're interested to do perturbation theory, we can split up this metric into a homogeneous and isotropic part. So I call that G mu nu bar, which is essentially just the FLRW metric that we saw last week. Okay, and then I tack onto that the perturbation part. So A square, that's the scale factor, okay? And then H mu nu. And the assumption here is that H mu nu must be much large, uh, smaller than uh, one. And just to remind you, the FLRW metric looks something like this. So this is the line element, and we tend to like to use conformal time in, uh, in perturbation theory, just makes things a bit nicer to work with. So I factor out the scale factor out the front, and the time part here is minus d eta, so eta is the time parameter, the conformal time, as said. And I'm just going to write the rest of the metric as gamma ij dxi dxj, okay? Now, we can split the metric like that. I can also split the stress energy tensor in exactly the same manner. All right, t mu nu, t bar mu nu plus delta t mu nu, and again, the T bar mu nu is exactly the, FR, the homogeneous isotropic stress energy tensor that we used last week. So, in other words, T bar mu nu is equal to diagonal minus rho bar P bar P bar P bar. Okay, in my metric convention, which is minus plus plus plus. Okay. Uh, the bar indicates that it's the, the average. 
Okay, whenever I write a bar, it's basically referring to whatever is happening in the homogeneous isotropic part. Okay. Now, um, so then what remains to be done essentially is to find a set of equations that would allow us to relate these perturbations in the stress energy tensor, which I said, okay, so delta T mu nu is a perturbation, so it has to be smaller than rho bar. And yeah, so what we need to do essentially is to uh, build a set of equations that would allow us to relate these delta T mu nu to the fluctuations in the metric. And then also, which basically makes use of the Einstein's equation, and uh, to find a way to describe how the um, fluctuations in the T mu nu uh, respond to H mu nu, okay? And that would be the Boltzmann equation, essentially. Now, before we can do that, there's, uh, what we need to do is to actually um, play around with our metric a little bit. Because right now, I have this H mu nu, and there are 10 independent components in, F mu nu, uh, in H mu nu, okay? Now, you can go off and write down uh, your equations already without thinking um, about what anything means, but there's actually a cleverer way, a clever way to um, write down my equations so that they are more physically meaningful. Okay, so the way we do that is to employ what we call harmonic decomposition. And essentially what harmonic decomposition is, is as follows. <coughs> so, as I mentioned very briefly uh, last week, the FLRW space-time uh, has a lot of symmetries in it, okay? You have translational symmetry in the, space, in, the, in the space part. You also have rotational symmetries, okay? So what this means is that these translational and rotational symmetries are also inherited by whatever small perturbations that you define on top of it, okay? So, in other words, what it means is that I can play with this, I can, I can work with this H mu nu, and then ask, can I classify this H mu nu in terms of its translational and its rotational properties, okay? Now, translational symmetry, that, that's fairly straightforward. Um, And that's because basically what you're trying, what you're demanding is that you want to find eigenfunctions of the Laplacian. Okay? So you write down Laplacian, and Q here is an eigenfunction. Okay? And okay, just to define my Laplacian, it's essentially just this uh, metric in the space space part. And then del i, del j, these are covariant derivatives. And if it's an eigenfunction, you should have k square q k. Okay? Now, this looks like jargon, but essentially all it means is that if you're in flat space, you do a Fourier transform. Okay? The eigenfunctions are just plane waves. which is why um, when we formulate um, perturbation theory in cosmology, we automatically go to case space because these are just, it's just easy to work with. Now, um, for rotational symmetry, Well, um, rotational symmetry implies that we can further decompose our perturbations into objects that transform irreducibly as scalars, vectors, or tensors under rotation. Okay? So in other words, if I, uh, in other words what I can do is that I can uh, further demand that I have 
eigenfunctions which are scalars, okay, so that having a Laplacian acting on it, I would just get minus k square q naught. So zero here indicates scalar. And uh, that's one degree of freedom. And vectors are those objects where, um, if I put a Laplacian on it, qi plus or minus 1 is equal to minus k square, and then qi plus or minus 1. And if it's a true vector, then this also has to be um, divergence free. Okay, so an additional condition we have to put on this is that this, the vector, the irreducible vector, has to be, has to satisfy um, the uh, divergence of qi plus or minus one is equal to zero. Okay, so um, that represents one constraint. So what this means in the end is that you essentially only have two degrees of freedom that are irreducible vectors. Okay. Um, last but not least, we also have tensors. So similar idea, you have Laplacian qij plus or minus two is equal to minus k square qij plus or minus two. And uh, this object here has to be transverse, which means that um, the divergence of qij plus or minus two has to be zero. This represents three constraints. And in addition, it has to be traceless. Which means that gamma ij, qij plus or minus two must be zero. Okay, so that's one constraint. Okay, so in the end, there are effectively just um, so you start with, uh, if you just have two degrees of freedom for tensors. Okay, so you start with six, you have three constraints coming from the transverse condition, one constraint coming from the traceless condition, so you're only left with two degrees of freedom. Okay? Now, um, it's a little bit abstract, but we can kind of try to visualize it a bit better. Um, so essentially, what it means, all it means is that if I think about having a corner system like so, so this is um, some direction, I call that EX, and then EY, and then EZ. And let's say I align my K vector in a set direction, so K points in this direction. Okay, then what it means is that the scalar part will be longitudinal. Okay, so it will just, the eigenfunction will just essentially be the plane wave, and that's it. Okay, um, irreducible vectors are <coughs> divergence free, so they're transverse to the k vector, and they live on the xy plane. Okay, so Q1 plus or minus 1 will be something that is well, a set living on the xy plane, like so. And then finally, the irreducible tensors are also transverse to the direction of the k vector. OK? 
Okay. <coughs> now, you might be wondering why am I calling them 0 plus or minus 1 plus or minus 2? And that is because if I think about these, um, these uh, irreducible scalar, vector, and tensor objects, if you are to do a rotation okay, of the xy plane by some angle phi, then they transform as so. They transform like q plus or minus m is equal to q plus or minus m and then e raised to the minus plus i m phi. Okay, so for m equals zero, you have a scalar, so rotation doesn't change this, uh, you know, the scalar um, at all. But uh, in the case of a vector, you are looking at plus or minus one. So, um, so m being one over here means that you have to rotate by two pi to recover itself. The vector, you know, you, you have a vector, you have to rotate by an angle of two pi to recover the vector. Okay. And lastly, if you have uh, m of plus or minus 2, in that case, you're dealing with a tensor object. And uh, to return back to its original configuration, you just have to do a rotation of pi. Okay? So that's the reason for this notation of 0 plus or minus 1 plus or minus 2. Now, um, having defined these uh, irreducible objects, I can also, um, under rotation, I can also construct tensor and vector objects out of these irreducible um, eigenfunctions. So for example, I can construct a vector out of a scalar. Okay? And I can do that. So that's what I call it. I can put qi over here. The index i indicates that it's a vector but it has a zero uh, superscript anyway because it's fundamentally a scalar. And I can do that by writing, for example, something like this, okay? Minus k to the minus one, and then I take the divergence, I'm oh, sorry, the gradient of the scalar eigenfunction, okay? Now, um, this is probably, uh, if you, that there's an example that you know very well, and that is if you want to calculate uh, the force from uh, a potential, what you do is that you take the, the, the gradient of the potential. Okay? So this is exactly that idea. Okay, so even though the force here is actually um, a vector, fundamentally it's something that comes from a scalar quantity. Okay, so that's what I'm saying here. Okay? Um, the extra k to the minus one here is just to keep everything the same dimensions. That's all. Okay, so it's a metal convention. Um, so that's a vector, which is constructed from a scalar. You can do the same thing with tensors as well. So I can construct a tensor out of um, a scalar by doing the following. I can write k to the minus 1 and then del i, del j plus one third gamma ij and then q naught, okay? The extra complication here with the one third gamma ij is simply to keep it traceless. Okay, that's one way to construct, uh, that this is a, how you can construct um, a tensor out of a scalar and uh, which is symmetric I and J, in under the exchange of I and J, which is what we want in, in GR. We always deal with symmetric um, tensors. And um, last but not least, you can construct a tensor out of a irreducible vector. Okay, and the way you do that is minus one on two K, and then now J Q I plus or minus one. Del i q j plus or minus one. Okay, and again, it's traceless. Um, don't bother copying this. I'm just showing you that this is how it's done. Uh, it's not like we're going to be 
really making use of these precise definitions again. Anyway, now, um, okay, so we have the irreducible scalars, vectors, and tensors. We also have vector and tensor objects that are constructed out of the irreducible scalar, vector, and tensors. What we can do now is to actually write down um, more general expressions for a general any kind of vector or any kind of tensor by um, uh, uh, basically combining these different objects. Okay, so for example, um, a vector, any vector, actually not just a vector, can be written like so. Okay, so if I have general vector called B, which is a function of X, I can write it as the sum of these coefficients, Vm, which is a function of K, and then an eigenfunction, Qi of M, and I sum over M from minus one to one, okay? So when I write something like this, this will contain the scalar component, okay, coming from vectors that are really, genuinely, uh, actually really scalars, and then I add onto it the two components that are genuinely irreducible vectors, okay? So every time I see a vector, I can just replace with uh, this, uh, such a sum, okay? Uh, similarly, with symmetric tensors, I can do the following. So a symmetric tensor might be called Hij, and then a function of x. Now, uh, it will have a trace and a traceless part, right? So the trace itself is obviously a scalar, okay? Because no matter what frame I look at, that trace is the same trace. Okay, so the trace is a scalar, so I write that as H, L, L for longitudinal, obviously, will be a function of k in general, and then I have my eigenfunction q0 and the gamma ij, okay? And then I have the rest of the, uh, the traceless part, which would be a sum over m from minus two to two, and then all the transverse parts here that are traceless as well, and uh, m and then function of k and then I have all the eigenfunctions which are well the tensor constructed from a scalar, tensor constructed from a vector and the irreducible tensor is all in there. Yeah. Sorry? The trace of this uh, uh, object. Okay so this would be this thing here in general would be um, a three by three I mean, think about it as a three by three matrix. It would have a trace. And a trace is certainly a scalar. Yeah, so I write that separately, because that's the trace. Um, I mean, it's, it's a separate thing. And then the rest of this is the traceless part of, uh, of this, uh, this, uh, this matrix over here, this tensor over there. And that has a decomposition in, um, into a scalar a vector and a tensor part, okay? And you can count all the, the, the degrees of freedom, okay? So, so the trace is one degree of freedom. Uh, and for the traceless part here, you will have um, one scalar, which is one degree of freedom. You will have one vector in there, but the vector itself is two degrees of freedom. You also have one tensor mode, which is itself also two degrees of freedom. So in here, you have five degrees of freedom, which is good, because when you add five to one, you have six degrees of freedom, which is the number of degrees of freedom you have in a symmetric three by three tensor. Okay, so everything is working out. I've just redefined everything to, as you, what I'm doing this will be obvious later on. Okay, uh, and then finally, of course, I didn't say anything about the scalar, but the scalar is just um, straightforward. You can just write a of x is equal to a k, and then times the I can function. I'm not sure if you can see this. <coughs> right.
OK, so let me clean the board. Now, back to, now we're going back to the uh, metric perturbations. So as I said earlier, we're splitting the metric into the homogeneous and isotropic part and a perturbative uh, perturbation part. Okay. <coughs> now, if I take H mu nu, the perturbation, okay, why it is as dx mu do x nu, then in general I can parameterize this thing as minus 2a d eta square, that's the time time part, and for the time space part I can write this as 2bi, and then d eta dxi, and I will have 2 hi dxi dxj in the space space part. Okay, this is usually how, how it's done, in, uh, how, how it's parameterized in um, uh, a lot of um, cosmological perturbation theory work. And now, why we did all of that decomposition is immediately, it's kind of obvious, okay? You can, every time, well actually maybe it's not completely obvious, but um, what you see here is that we have A, which is obviously a scalar, okay? And we have also Bi over here, but as I said earlier, this is a spatial vector, so I can just apply a decomposition like that, okay? And uh, then I have Hij, which can be decomposed in this way, okay? So, um, that's, a, that's a scalar, I yeah, don't know that. Um, no, okay, so that's a scalar, that's a, vec um, yeah, that's a vector, but not, okay, general vector, which has a decomposition, H, I, J, you can decompose as well. So if I now look at all the degrees of freedom that we have, we will have basically four scalars. Okay, so A, which is this one over here, there will be a scalar component from B, I, which is, which we'll call B naught. Um, in H, I, J over here, we saw that there is a scalar part coming from the trace of the, uh, of the tensor, and then there's also a traceless uh, scalar uh, component as well. So there will be H, L going into my list, and then H, T naught. Okay, so I have four times one degree of freedom. I have two vectors in here, okay, so one of them comes from B uh, plus or minus one, so coming from here, and I also have a vector component from HT, okay, plus or minus one. So this is two times two degrees of freedom, which is good, and then lastly we have one tensor component, which resides in the Hij and is traceless and transverse. So Ht plus or minus 2. Okay, so this is 1 time times 2 degrees of freedom and if you add up all of the degrees of freedom we have 10 degrees of freedom. Okay, so that's good because that's exactly what we'd expect in any case. Okay? Now, so at this point is a um, complication. That is, not all of these 10 degrees of freedom are physical. And that is because um, when we, whenever we write down a theory in a covariant way, there's redundancy, okay? And, um, and in fact, of these 10 degrees of freedom, only six of them are um, physical, okay? The other four degrees of freedom are called gauge modes. And that comes about 
because when I build a perturbation theory, I have the freedom to choose the mapping between um, the real space-time manifold to the fictitious background manifold, the FLRW uh, space-time, on which I build a perturbation theory. So here is a picture that illustrates what's happening, sort of. Um, so I'll move that board. A little bit. So as you can see over here, if I um, so so the, what the schematic is illustrating is that the, the 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 blue manifold here is the real space time that I want to describe, and uh, yellow is the FRRW space time that is like the simplest I can uh, you know it's just well just the homogeneous and isotropic background, and I want to build my perturbation theory on top of this on this, okay. So I have a freedom to choose whether I want to map the point Q to the point P. Okay? If I did that, then this is mapping one, then I would identify Q with P so that uh, you know, I'll, I'll have uh, the, the, the background metric at the point P and the perturbations will be defined at the point P as well. But there's nothing to stop me from choosing a different mapping. I could also choose mapping too. Okay? So I map R to P. Okay? And when I do that, what I will find is that the perturbations would be different, okay? So, depending on how I choose the mapping, I could end up with uh, totally different perturbations. And this is because I'm free to choose what mapping um, um, I, I uh, apply. Now, does it matter? Not really, actually. Um, uh, because, you know, it's, it's, it's up to me what I, how, how I want to choose the mapping. But what is useful, however, is to know how I transform between the two mappings. Okay? And to do that, essentially, um, what we need to do is to figure out the gauge transformation. Okay? So choosing a mapping is sometimes what we call gauge, uh, fixing a gauge, and uh, or choosing a gauge. And to go between the two mappings is essentially called a gauge transformation. Now, um, so, so which, what can I get rid of? Um, maybe this. So to figure out how I uh, can go from uh, one mapping to another, I can essentially think about it as if I was doing a uh, corner transformation. Okay. So, um, so in particular, uh, I can think about moving from the point Q to the point R as if I was doing a corner transformation, like so. Okay. So x alpha is equal to x. So x prime alpha is equal to x alpha plus psi alpha of x, where psi is this basically this four vector that allows you to go from q to r. Okay, and x prime is basically the coordinate at the point r, and x is the coordinate at the point q. Okay, and this is supposed to be infinitesimal. All right. Now, um, it's quite common to parameterize this, uh, this uh, psi here in terms of a function L, uh, sorry, function T, the time part, and also a spatial vector Li. Okay? Now, um, Li, I can lower it as well with the gamma ij. And just like we did before with the SVT decomposition for all spatial uh, 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 scalars, vectors, and tensors, I can also decompose this Li into a sum over m from minus 1 to 1 Li m and then the eigenfunctions Qi m. Okay? So then to figure out the transformation between um, the perturbations in these different mappings, all I have to do is to perform a corner transformation, okay, and see how 
the metric transforms under corner transformation. So essentially what it means is that if I want to write down the metric G alpha beta that is seen at x prime, I would write del x gamma, del x prime alpha, del x delta, and then del x prime beta. Okay, so that's just a corner transformation. And then g gamma delta of x. Okay, this is totally standard corner transformation that I'm sure you've seen. And the key point here is that, well, I have, um, if I look at on this side, that's the, that's the metric at x, in other words, at the point q, okay? And uh, this has the form g bar gamma delta at x plus a square h gamma delta at x, okay? Uh, here on the other side, I'm trying to transform into this g prime, alpha beta, and again I can write this out, okay? So this is equal to g prime alpha beta. Actually, the first thing I need to do is to make sure that I have the same uh, argument, okay? So this is x prime in here, so I write this as g prime alpha beta x plus um, uh, uh, Psi gamma d gamma g alpha beta prime x. So that's just a Taylor expansion. Okay. And um, this can be further simplified, or not simplified, can further expand it into g bar alpha beta x plus a square h prime alpha beta x. And then I add to this apart from the Taylor expansion from the line before. Okay? Okay, so I have this part here expanded out, <coughs> and that's the metric at the point X, so it looks like this. Uh, the corner transformations I can rewrite as well. This is basic, well, I can write them out as well. So this here, is just equal to chronica delta delta beta minus db psi delta, okay? Same thing with this term, I just don't want to write it out. So what you can now do, having all these pieces all figured out, is to basically just multiply it out and then expand to our first order in the small parameters. The small parameters being the perturbations themselves, as well as this psi parameter, which is meant to be infinitesimal, okay? And the key is that um, you always have this g bar alpha beta of x, okay? Same over here, okay? So these are always the same, okay? And so once you actually multiply this out, what you'll find is a relation between uh, h bar, uh, h, h prime, and uh, the, the original h. So the h that is seen at the point r, and how that relates to the h that is seen at the point q. Okay, so I can I can write this out, um, just uh, just so that you have uh, you can see what it looks like. Looks like this. A square h prime alpha beta of x, a square h alpha beta, x minus g alpha delta, x d beta psi delta minus g gamma beta x, d alpha psi gamma minus psi gamma d gamma g bar alpha beta x. Absolutely horrible and don't bother copying. Don't go bother copying it at all. <laughs> and in fact, um, it's more common to uh, see this expression um, ex re-expressed in terms of 
um, these T and L parameters. That's actually, if you're looking at the cosmology literature, you're far more likely to see this transformation expressed in those terms, and actually it looks like this. Okay. So, what do we have? Okay, so that's what happens if you multiply it out. And um, so you have, uh, you know, transformation from A prime to A and how that depends on the uh, gauge parameter T. Uh, that's, well, a whole long list of things. Now, um, if you stare at this list of transformations, what you see immediately is that the tensor modes are gauge invariant, which is kind of expected, because basically these are gravitational waves. Okay, traceless transverse, it's always the same. Um, then you have the tool scalar modes. Okay, so you have A prime and B prime. And these are both, well, clearly gauge dependent because it depends on your choice of L, zero, and T. So what this means, and same with the, uh, the, uh, the vector modes as well. So you have B plus or minus one, that also is a gauge dependent quantity, okay? So it depends on uh, what you uh, want to uh, do with L plus or minus one, uh, okay? So um, what this means is that I have the freedom to choose some of these uh, scalar and vector modes to be zero, okay? In order to simplify uh, my life. Okay, in the calculations. Now, um, so I can, for example, choose, uh, you know, A prime to be zero and B zero to be zero. Then I'll be left with two scalar modes. That's okay. You have, to, you have enough degrees of freedom to do that. Similarly, with B plus or minus one or HT plus or minus one, I can set either of them to be zero. I have enough gauge degrees of freedom to, to, to allow me to do that. Now, um, as with all gauge choices in, in all, all, kind, all branches of physics, which one you choose is really a matter of, well, first of all, whether it simplifies your equations, okay? It may be guided by, you know, if you, you might want to do analytical solutions and using one particular gauge might make your um, analytical solutions more uh, easily visible. Sometimes, most of the time, we do numerical solutions of my, uh, of my equations. And uh, so gauge choices could also be um, uh, uh, guided by whether you get better numerical solutions, more better numerical stability of your solutions or not, okay? Um, another important thing, uh, particularly if you're doing analytics, is Newtonian intuition, okay? Because after all, we are dealing with some kind of gravity theory and if by choosing a gauge, you reduce your equation to a point whether you can clearly identify um, uh, the solutions, uh, uh, the similarity of the solutions to the Newtonian uh, physics case, then that's often a good thing to do as well. And um, so when we, uh, yeah, so when we, so, so when we look at inhomogeneous universe, um, there are many, basically many different gauges that are in use and some different gauges are in use at different times. Okay, so the inflation people like to use certain gauges. The people who do CMB will use a different gauge. People who want to go into nonlinear evolution will use a different gauge again. Okay, so you will have to, uh, so, so that's why it is important that we know how to transform between gauges. <coughs> so just um, a few uh, choices of gauges that people um, often use. So that's one that is called a conformal Newtonian gauge. And essentially the idea here is that you choose HT naught and HB naught to be zero. And in fact, I, uh, I should really do this on the board. Um, There's a Newtonian gauge is important, so it um, needs a bit more time. So, um, Newtonian gauge is this one. So you set HT naught prime to zero and B naught prime to zero as well. So, setting the first, uh, setting HT naught to zero immediately allows you to solve for L naught to be minus ht naught divided by k. 
and uh, setting B0 prime to zero also allows you to solve for T. Okay, so this is B0 divided by K minus one on K DL0 the eta. Since I had a solution from the previous line for L, I can substitute that in as well. So I have B0 K minus, oh, sorry, plus one on K square DH T naught d eta. Okay? So this is a nice gauge to use because first of all, these gauge parameters are completely fixed. Okay? Furthermore, if we examine what's left behind of uh, in the metric, what we have is essentially the following. We will have ds square is equal to a square eta and then minus plus or minus 2a d eta square plus 1 plus 2hl gamma ij dxi dxj. Okay? And that's very nice because you've seen a metric of that form before, I'm sure. Okay? So when uh, probably in, in an introductory GR course sometime, uh, you took maybe in the last couple of years, you, def you would have encountered the static weak field metric. Which is something like this. You have ds square is equal to 1 plus Two psi dt square plus one minus two psi delta ij dxi dxj. Okay, that's the metric that you use to calculate everything from um, light deflection in the solar system to perihelion shift, and basically all the all the um, a lot of the GR phenomena can be calculated using this weak field metric. Okay, I mean the solar system test anyway, I mean. So uh, if you compare this weak field metric to uh, what we have now here and what, what, what is left over after we've set the Newtonian, picked the Newtonian gauge is that you see a lot of similarities between the two. Okay, so the A here maps nicely to the psi. Um, the HL here sort of maps to this psi as well. Okay, so um, this means that picking a Newtonian gauge also has the advantage of it being um, physically intuitive, okay, because it looks so much like what we know from Newtonian physics already, okay? So, I mean, a weak field metric, by the way, if you go to the non-relativistic limit, you get back exactly Newtonian physics, okay? So, that's the reason why this is called a Newtonian gauge, um, this particular choice of, um, you know, picking certain perturbations to be zero. Uh, yet another thing I need to introduce is, um, well, the, what I call the Bardeen potentials. Essentially, you can find the Bardeen potentials by um, uh, uh, so you have okay. We've seen a prime, right? Okay, and we just worked out over here what the um, gauge parameters L naught and T should be once I have picked H T prime to be zero and B naught prime to be zero. Okay, so I've got these two solutions. So what I can do now is to put these solutions back into my expression for a prime and HL prime, so those parameters that are non-zero, okay? So when I do that, what I find immediately is A minus D D eta plus A H, so I'll skip about five steps in between, but you get the point, it's just substituting things in. B naught of K plus one on K square, D H T naught D Eta. So this thing here is the first Bardeen potential. Okay, that's called usually labeled psi A. 
And the next body in potential you can construct from taking the expression for L prime. And what you're left with is HL plus one third HT naught AH and then minus B naught K plus one on K square DH T naught the uh, sorry del eta. Okay, and this is the second body in potential which we call phi, and I don't know why people put a label H there as well. Okay, so the nice thing about these body potentials is that they're often called gauge invariant quantities in the sense that you can construct your body potential no matter what you do your perturbation theory in, uh, what gauge you choose to do your perturbation theory in. Okay, once you have calculated all your perturbations in whatever gauge, um, you can always use these expressions to construct the two body potentials. Okay, so they gauge and vary in that sense. Okay, that you can always arrive at the same number, um, no matter what um, uh, um, uh, gauge you use to, to to do your calculations. But um, so why why bother calculating them? Well, you calculate them because these are basically these psi a and um, minus phi h over here are essentially the two perturbation parameters that we have in the Newtonian gauge, which, as I said before, has a nice Newtonian physics intuition behind it. Okay, so um, that's basically the role of the body in potential. Yeah, I mean they, they um, are, you know, you do your calculations and then you transform whatever you have back into the body in potentials, and then you can kind of interpret it give it a nice physical interpretation by kind of relying on your Newtonian intuitions. Okay, so that, that's primarily the role of these, these two potentials. Okay, uh, there's no, no deeper reason than that, really. Okay, okay um, so that's the Newtonian gauge and the body in potentials. And um, as I was uh, saying earlier, uh, they are, well, you know, nice and physically intuitive, but there are, of course, also other gauges you can choose. You can choose a spatially flat gauge, you can, which is uh, uh, completely fixed as well. Sometimes you get simpler equations of motion. It's usually used in inflation calculations. Uh, the synchronous gauge is another one. You can, uh, that's basically fixed by uh, fixing A prime and B to zero. It's not completely fixed uh, because um, once you basically do the same thing as I did before to try to figure out what are the gauge parameters, what you'll find is that there are still unfixed integration constants, but um, that it's not a big deal, really. It has no physical um, impact on your, on your final results. Uh, but it's often used by people who do CMB calculations because of numerical stability. Okay. So let's see the scalar um, gauges. You can, of course, also do things for your, your vectors. Okay. But vectors are usually not very much discussed in cosmology because we don't expect vector modes to be generated from inflation at all. Okay, so, and, and even if they're generated, they die away very quickly, so they tend to be, vector modes tend to be ignored by everyone. Okay, so, um, okay, that's the decomposing the, um, the, uh, 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 the, um, <coughs> uh, the, uh, the metric. Now, of course, I still have to deal with the um, stress energy tensor. So let's look at that. So as I said before, um, in the stress energy tensor, you are again splitting, you're essentially, well, again splitting it up into a homogeneous part and an inhomogeneous part. So you write T mu nu is equal to T bar mu nu plus delta T mu nu, okay? And we have seen before that T bar mu nu is just something that's diagonal. You have row bar, P bar, P bar, P bar in the entries. Now, suppose now I only have perfect fluids in the universe. Then for a perfect fluid, there's a famous expression that we can write down to describe what 
the stress energy tensor should be. Okay, which I'm sure a lot of people have seen this. Looks like this. So you have the energy density in the rest frame of the fluid plus the pressure of the fluid also in its own rest frame. And then you tack onto that the uh, fall velocity of the fluid and then g mu nu pressure of the rest frame. Okay, so rest equals rest frame. And u here is the fall velocity of the fluid. Okay? Now, in principle, that's it. If you only have perfect fluids, you just stick this expression in and that, that's done. Um, but, you know, we, uh, when in CMB, at least uh, calculations and perturbation calculations, we want to simplify a little bit further. And one simplification is to um, at least write it in something that's a bit more intuitive than this. And, and one thing that we do is to recognize that when we are dealing with uh, cosmological fluids, they are not really moving very fast. Okay, you have the nice FLRW universe where everything is essentially, well, everything is stationary with respect to the, um, the co-moving observer. And when we perturb around it a little bit, all the fluids that I have, photons, dark matter, are also moving just by small amounts. Okay, they are moving, always moving at non-relativistic speeds. Okay, nothing is moving at the speed of light um, on, um, on these cosmological scales. Okay. So what this means immediately is that I would expect a fall velocity to have a space component that is much less than time component. Okay, this is just a statement about the fact that this is non-relativistic. And the corner velocity, which is defined as dx di and then d eta, same as ui divided by u0, sorry, ui divided by u0, would also be very much less than 1. Okay? So then the form of the um, stretch energy tensor would be uh, kind of almost easy to guess, okay? Given these uh, conditions. Let's see what we have. Let's look at the time time part. Okay. Now, the time time part here, in the case where my u0 would dominate over my ui's anyway, I would expect most of the perturbations to be coming from any kind of intrinsic perturbations that are there in the energy density and in the, um, in the energy density. Okay. So, in fact, um, t00 which will be t bar zero zero plus any perturbation that we have, would be generally equal to rho bar plus delta rho. Any kind of velocity um, uh, dependent perturbations that you would kind of induce for t zero zero must be tiny because I am never dealing with anything moving at relativistic speeds. Okay? Now, I'm just waving my hands here. You can actually do the calculation, figure out what your you, you, your, your four velocities are, stick them back in, you'll find the same thing, okay? So, that's that. Now, for um, Ti0, um, now, this term here is not present in an FRW universe, because as soon as this term is present in, your, in, 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 in the universe, then your universe is not isotropic anymore, okay? But since we're dealing with perturbations, we are allowed to have a Ti0 term, and this would come from the fact that my fluid is moving. Okay, so I would expect it to be basically, proportion, it will be proportional to the fact, uh, to, to, to the corner velocity of, of the fluid. Okay. Um, I can also write down a T0i. This one, okay, so this is purely a perturbation, that's it. Now, I can also write down a T0i term, which is, T, which is also a perturbation. It looks more or less the same as the Ti0, 
but it's also slightly different. Vi minus Bi is in fact what it looks like. So we have the velocity, but with a lower index. And um, by lowering the index, I also actually pick up um, one of the metric perturbations, Pi. This is really just a technicality. Don't worry about it, OK? Um, last but not least, I have Tij, which is the uh, space-based part. Now, in the um, isotropic and homogeneous case, the uh, space-based part is just pressure, OK? And um, here, if I allow for inhomogeneity, and again, if I'm just limiting myself to a perfect fluid, and again, I'm dealing with things that are not moving terribly fast, then I would also expect to essentially just see a pressure perturbation. Okay, something like this. So this is what happens if you have a perfect fluid. Again, um, I wave my hands here to arrive at these, uh, these expressions. You can actually calculate it properly by figuring out what the four velocities are and uh, you, you get the same answer anyway. So here's a summary of um, what I just wrote down. Now, the other thing is, well, um, that's the case for a perfect fluid, right? But I don't necessarily just have perfect fluids in the universe. And in fact, I can definitely expect some fluids to be highly imperfect. So the best example of that are just standard model neutrinos. These are completely not perfect fluids after they have decoupled. They will be free streaming, they're not interacting. If they're not interacting, you have no local thermal equilibrium. You cannot basically turn these things into perfect fluids. Once they start free streaming, they're doing whatever. So what needs to be done is to add some kind of description to describe this imperfectness. And actually, it's quite straightforward. We just have to add and an isotropic stress, OK? And that enters into the space-based part of the, um, of the stress energy tensor. It's an anisotropic stress. It's uh, traceless, OK? It has to be traceless. Anything that, is, uh, that contains a trace would just be pressure, OK? Now, um, this is not the only kind, this is not the only way to make a fluid imperfect, but in general, but uh, for the kind of uh, like standard, more or less standard lambda CDM like kind of universe, this is the only uh, imperfect um, uh, in addition, uh, addition that we need to add to the stress energy tensor. Okay, because um, you know in lambda CDM we don't essentially don't have anything strange. We only have particles moving inside, and uh, we can describe the particles with a dilute gas approximation. And when once we're in that limit, then the only kind of imperfection you can get in a fluid is in the form of an anisotropic stress. Okay, so that suffices for um, our description. Okay. Now, um, so that's uh, uh, essentially the stress energy tensor that we use. We have a perfect fluid, and then we tack onto it an anisotropic stress that uh, describes the, uh, in, in any kind of imperfectness, uh, imperfection that comes from uh, free-streaming neutrinos, for example. And as I said before, you know, we spend 45 minutes or so talking about decomposition in, uh, of uh, scalar vectors and, and tensors. I can also do exactly the same thing because I have Vi here, which is the bulk velocity of a fluid. Okay, so I can apply the same decomposition here as well. I also have anisotropic stress, which is itself a traceless um, uh, uh, three tens um, ten tens uh, uh, tensor, uh, three by three. And uh, so I can decompose this thing as well, spatial tensor, I can decompose this as well. So what I get in the end once I do the decomposition is essentially just basically replacing every time I see a VI, I replace it with a sum over these different, um, you, know, you know, scalar, irreducible scalar and irre irreducible uh, vector components and so on. Okay, so VI becomes that. It's the VI that becomes his. And then my anisotropic stress gets decomposed in this way, and the pressure perturbation is itself a scalar because it's related to the trace of the um, of the space part of the space based part of the stress energy tensor. <coughs> All right. Now, um, 
Yep. Okay. So that's just to remind everyone what we're looking at. Okay. That's uh, so pressure is in a diagonal, um, and uh, the anisotropic stress is basically all of these off-diagonal terms here in the um, in the space-space part of the stress energy tensor. Sometimes it's called shear stress, but just a matter of um, what you call it. Now, um, so we looked at how um, uh, a metric perturbation transform on the gauge transformation. And um, you can also do the same thing and ask how these um, perturbations that we have written down in the stress energy tensor uh, transform on the gauge transformation. Okay. And again, the, the idea is, is, is quite similar. You pretend that gauge transformation is sort of like a corner transformation. And then, so you again write down this x prime alpha is equal to x alpha plus psi x. Okay, that's your corner transformation, which we describe again with this um, set of parameters, t and li. And then we ask ourselves, how does the stress energy tensor transform under this transformation, this, uh, this corner transformation? Okay, so we write T prime alpha beta at X prime is equal to T X prime alpha, T X mu, T X nu, T X prime beta, T mu nu. Okay, so again, it's just a question of sticking in T is equal to T plus delta T into the expression, crunch through it, and then you will find a relation between um, the delta t in one gauge and then the delta t in another gauge. Okay, so that's, uh, that's just algebra, not particularly exciting, uh, but you, you can do that, and if you did that, this is what you'll end up with. Okay? You will end up with a set of relations for, um, uh, of how to transform uh, between the energy density perturbation in one gauge and how it relates to uh, density perturbation in another gauge, pressure perturbation, velocity perturbations, and also what you see also is that the anisotropic stress is gauge invariant. Okay, which is not surprising, which is wholly not surprising because you know your, your gauge transformation is essentially a corner transformation. Okay, and, and it's divided by a vector. Okay, so anything that is beyond just vector as tensorial um, will not be affected by the gauge transformation. So that's, that's uh, kind of, kind of um, that makes a lot of sense, I think. Um, right. Okay. <coughs> so in the last uh, couple of minutes, uh, well, not a couple of minutes, like I think I have 15 minutes, so let me just use that. Um, Okay. Right. Um, okay. So, uh, so what do we have now? So we have my our uh, x mu nu of x, which is, has been SVT decomposed. We also have our delta t mu nu, which has also been SVT decomposed. Okay, so we know how they transform, how we can break them, we have break, broken everything up into scalar, vector, and tensor components. Then the final step basically is just to uh, stick all of these things back to the Einstein's equation and then f figure out what the Einstein equation would have to, m must be, must look like um, for the scalar component, the vector component, and the tensor component. And uh, uh, this is possible because um, if you write down the uh, Einstein's equation, so the Einstein tensor is g mu nu, I can break it up into, again, a homogeneous isotropic part plus the perturbation. Okay? T, oh no, that's right. Mu nu plus delta T mu nu. <coughs> Now, um, that's the homogeneous isotropic part, and um, we have uh, uh, um, the perturbations over here. So, um, so immediately this tells you that uh, we have delta G 
mu nu is equal to 8 pi g delta t mu nu, okay? Now, we've done all the decomposition already, so um, this also means that if I'm to decompose the Einstein's tensor, I would be able to basically just map my, um, you know, any scalar g mu nu to um, the scalar delta t mu nu, okay? Now, the thing is that we're doing linear perturbation theory, and so even though the Einstein tensor itself is nonlinear in the metric, okay, if I'm sticking with linear perturbation theory, all of these terms here, all of g mu nu, would be linear in h mu nu, okay? So whatever, in other words, whatever I have, however I've, de the, the way I, uh, when, I've, when I decompose h mu nu and I've identified all the scalar components, once I stick them into the Einstein's tensor and I only keep terms to linear order in my perturbation, those scalar components would just remain exactly scalar. And the vector components will be vector, the tensor components will be tensor. Yeah, you would never have end up having any mixing, okay? Simply because I have demanded that I'm only interested in perturbations to linear order. Okay, so that, that's, that's uh, really the reason why we even do SVT decomposition to begin with. It wouldn't even make sense to do SVT if I have a huge amount of mixing between uh, scalar vector and tensor, okay? So at a linear level, there's no mixing between the modes. And uh, so um, I can, you know, all the scalar perturbations will, um, in other words, all the scalar perturbations would enter into the Einstein tensor and they would only respond to scalar perturbations in T mu nu. Vector, yeah, vector versus vector, tensor versus tensor. Okay, so that's uh, the, the, power, uh, the, the, the power of the, um, the SVT. You can really neatly um, separate out these different modes. Okay, so um, just to write this out, so g mu nu of zero would be exclusively a function of a, b naught, hl, ht naught, okay? And we expect it to be dependent only on the scalar part of um, t mu nu, which would only depend on rho p v naught and the scalar anisotropic stress. Okay, nothing else. And then you can write down something, a similar relation also for the vector modes and the tensor modes. Okay? And um, so the rest is just a lot of calculations. If you really want to do it, <laughs> you can, uh, you know, calculate your Riemann tensor, calculate your Ricci tensor, calculate your Ricci scalar, compose your Einstein tensor and, you know, crunch this all out. Um, I'm not advocating that anyone should even bother doing it because it's been done by many people before, decades before. So I, I, I'll just look them up in the literature. And that's what I'm going to do as well. I'm just going to show you those equations um, that uh, you arrive at once you have crunched through, um, done, done the algebra. Okay, so uh, what I'm showing you here are basically the Einstein equations in the Newtonian gauge. Um, after you do the calculation, so you can see here, phi here is the, um, let, me just, let me just write down again, phi is, um, so in the Newtonian gauge, you have ds squared is um, a squared, one plus two psi, and then plus one minus two phi, gamma ij, dxi, dxj, that's a Newtonian gauge. And uh, what you see here are, well, basically four um, <coughs> in, uh, equations that you can obtain. Okay, the first one basically is how the, uh, the two gate metric perturbations respond to the uh, density perturbations. This one here shows um, the dependence on the, um, any kind of you know, scalar velocity. And uh, this one here shows the dependence on the pressure, perturbation, and last but not least, the difference between phi and psi is proportional to the uh, scalar anisotropic stress coming from any kind of imperfect fluid you have in the universe. Uh, there are four equations over here, but only two of them are linearly independent. Uh, there are actually another two equations that you can come up with simply by uh, using the um, cons local conservation of energy momentum, so basically just applying this condition. 
uh, you can actually further derive uh, two equations that look like this. But again, they're not both linearly independent. One of them, only one of them is linearly independent. Uh, that's for the scalar uh, perturbations. You can, of course, also do the same thing for the vector perturbations. That would look something like this. Not, again, just to show you what they are, not particularly interesting for our purposes. And uh, last but not least, you also have the uh, tensor Einstein equations, which essentially describe the propagation of gravitational waves. Okay, so you have a uh, wave equation in an expanding universe. Okay, and this is a source term. Uh, so, so uh, an isotropic stress is a sort, actually it's a sink um, term for uh, gravitational wave propagation. Now, um, uh, last uh, couple of minutes, I just want to go back to the scalar Einstein equation just to um, highlight my point of why it is that um, the, this, um, the, the, uh, that uh, what we're looking at actually here actually makes a lot of sense, because otherwise it's just equations. Um, So, <coughs> if you just focus on the first two equations, okay, and we combine them together, then what I'll have on the, so the first two, we just combine them, we add them together. So, then what I'll have is minus k square, okay, plus 3 capital K, capital K is the curvature parameter, okay, can be plus 1, minus 1, or 0. Phi. Okay, and then the second term will disappear once I combine with the second equation. So that's that's it of the left-hand side, and on the right-hand side I have four pi g a square, and then delta rho, and coming from the second equation I have um, da, 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 uh, what do I have? Yep, three h rho bar plus p bar v naught divided by k. Okay, so um, that's the uh, second term. Now, uh, what we see immediately is that, okay, we have the delta rho, the, the, the delta rho term, which is a density perturbation. And this second term here is proportional to any kind of you know, non-zero bulk velocity of the stuff in the universe. But this second term here is proportional to h divided by k. Okay? What's h divided by k? Well, curly h is the co-moving um, Hubble parameter, which is the same as the scale factor multiplied by the Hubble parameter that we probably are all familiar with by now divided by k. So, k here is essentially something that comes from the Fourier transform, it's a wave number, okay? And the wave number is inversely proportional to the wavelength of a perturbation. Okay. So, essentially, when I look at this ratio here, what I'm comparing um, are the following things. I'm comparing the co-moving perturbation wavelength with the co-moving Hubble length. And I have two limits for this. I could have K divided by H being much much larger than one. Okay, so k is much larger than h, curly h. In this case, um, what we're dealing with are length scales that are much smaller than the co-moving Hubble length. And we like to call these scales sub-horizon. Okay, even though, as I mentioned last Friday, or was it Thursday, um, it's actually a bit of a misnomer, there's no horizon, really. Okay, you're just comparing a length scale with the Hubble length. Okay, but nonetheless, I just stick with conventional usage and call it hot, hot sub horizon. I'll just put it in inverted commas. Okay, and of course, you also have the other limit. K of H is much less than one. 
Okay, so these scales are the ones that are much, much larger than the co-moving Hubble length. Okay, and so these are super horizon scales. So if I'm only interested in what I can see, sub-horizon, okay, length scales that are within the observable universe that I can see and measure, then I'll essentially be looking at this limit. Okay? So if I'm in the sub-horizon limit, what it immediately means is that this second term here will disappear. Okay? It won't even contribute in the sub-horizon limit. Okay? So in the surprising limit, the right-hand side of the equation becomes simply 4 pi g a square delta rho. Okay? I don't have to worry about this. Now, um, on the left-hand side, I have minus k square plus 3k. And k, as I said earlier, is something that is basically just a curvature parameter. But we've also seen that... Um, present day observations tell us that k is very small. We don't, we don't see a lot of curvature at all. Okay, so we can expect this to be small to begin with. Okay, and we would expect k in general to be larger than, I mean the k square term here to be larger than the 3k. Okay, so, um, so what this means is that the left hand side now becomes minus k square on phi. And then we now combine the left hand side and the right hand side together, what I'll find immediately is minus k square phi is equal to 4 pi g a square delta rho. And this has a very familiar form. This is essentially a Poisson equation. Okay? In, in Fourier space, of course. Okay? So, um, so these, these Einstein equations are, are not just you know, weird things. They, if you choose the right gauge, you can actually quite nicely interpret them and then apply your uh, Newtonian intuition. OK, so I uh, am running out of time. And, but I am more or less where I want to be, so that's not a bad thing. And uh, yeah, so I'll stop here. Um, you can ask me questions now or, I don't know, during lunchtime or rest of the day about this. Um, I guess people want to go to lunch. Yeah. <coughs> Any questions for anyone? Yep. Can you give a good intuition about the synchronous gauge? The what, sorry? The synchronous gauge. The synchronous gauge. <laughs> the synchronous gauge basically means that everyone share the same measure things in the same time. I'm not sure how you can really nicely interpret, uh, interpret it in, uh, um, I mean, if you want to map it back to Newtonian physics, it's, uh, uh, it's you have to do it via the, um, the Bardeen potentials. I, I don't know if it can be very nicely interpreted. Um, it also fails very easily. Um, I and mean, once you go to nonlinear scales, it fails. So I, I tend not to like it at all because I don't know what I'm looking at half of the time. So yeah, I, I have no physical intuition really working with a synchronous gauge.